Good day, dear students. I am Chimidron of Sergei Nikolaevich, the head of Human Anatomy Department in Samara State Medical University. And today we'll talk about uh, sensitive organs and in details we'll talk about hearing, equilibrium, uh, at about gustation. In details we'll talk about uh, ears and also about tongue and taste analyzers. So first let's we talk about auditory organ or ears, um, organ of hearing. And so you may see that it divides in three parts, external ear, middle ear and internal or inner ear. So the external ear consists of the arico you may see this article on the picture and the external auditory meatus also you can see this meatus here the auricle commonly called the ear is formed of elastic cartilage covered with skin this cartilage determines the external shape of the auricle and its projection the three carved margin called the hallux antihalix located parallel to it the anterior prominence tragus you may see tragus here and also antitragus situated behind it downward the ear terminates as a lobule which has no cartilage Here, you may see it here. This is characteristic uh, progressive developmental sign for man. In the depression on the lateral surface of the aurical concha auriculari, behind the tragus, here, in the external auditory meatus around which the reminder of the rudimentary muscles rudimentary muscles you also may see there here uh, has been preserved uh, there are no functional significance since the, since the aurical of man is immobile some others consider it to be a rudimentary formation but others disagree with this point of view because the cartilaginous skeleton of the human ear is well defined. So you may see that external ear or arico uh, arose at the site of protrusion of the ectoderm in embryo at the first jaw arch. The external auditory Meatus, meatus acousticus externus is Latin, consists of two parts, cartilaginous and bony. So you can see also cartilaginous part and bone part here. The cartilaginous auditory meatus is a continuation of the auricle cartilage in the form of groove open upward and to the back. Its internal end is joined by means of connective tissue with the edge of the tympanic part of temporal bone. The cartilaginous auditory meatus constitutes two-thirds of the whole inter external auditory meatus. The bony auditory meatus constitutes um, two-thirds of entire length of auditory meatus opens to the exterior by means of porus acousticus externus on the periphery of which runs a circular bony tympanic groove sulcus tympanicus so you may see the bone part and also you can see the cartilaginous part and also you may see the cartilaginous part of acousticus meatus here from external view the direction of how auditory meatus 
is frontal in general, but it does not advance in a straight line. It wins in form of letter S, and you may see letter shape, letter S shape uh, of auditory meatus here. So, uh, because of the curves of the auditory meatus, the deeply situated tympanic membrane can only be seen by pulling the auricle backward, outward and upward. The skin uh, that covers the auricle continues into the external auditory meatus. In the cartilaginous part of the meatus, the skin is very rich both in sebaceous glands and in a particular kind of glands the serminous glands, glandulit serminosi, it's in Latin, which produce a yellow fish secretion, serumen or earwax. In this part, there are also short hairs growing in the skin. You may see here. So, uh, they prevent tiny particles from getting into the organ. In the bony part of the duct, the skin thins out considerably and extends without interruption onto the external surface of the tympanic membrane, which closes the medial end of the meatus. So, let's we talk about tympanic membrane. You can see this membrane here on this photo and on this picture. The tympanic membrane of ear drum, uh, membrana tympanic in Latin, is located at the junctions of the external and middle ears. Its edge fits into the sulcus tympanicus at the end of the external auditory meatus as into a frame. The tympanic membrane is cured in the sulcus tympanicus by a fibrocartilaginous ring, annulus fibrocartilaginous, it's in Latin. The membrane is inclined because of the oblique position of the middle end of the auditory meatus, but in newborns it's almost horizontal. The tympanic membrane in adult is hollow in shape and measures um, 11 millimeters in length and 9 mm in breadth. It's a thin semi-transparent sheath in which the center called amber, you may see the center here and also you may see here, is drawn in like a shallow funnel. Its external surface is covered by a thinned out continuation of the skin covering the auditory meatus um, at the internal surface by the mucous lining of the tympanic cavity. The substance of the membrane itself between the two layers consists of fibrous connective tissue, the fibers of which in the peripheral part of the membrane run in radial direction and in the central part in circular direction. In the upper part, the tympanic membrane contains no fibrous fibers uh, and consists only of the skin and mucous layer and thin stratum of loose tissue between them. This part, you may see it here, so uh, this part of the tympanic membrane is softer and less tightly stretched. It has therefore been named the flaccid part, or pars flaccida in Latin, in contrast to the main tightly stretched trans part, Pax tensoria, it's in Latin. So, the tympanic membrane, the whole anterior wall of the external auditory meatus, as well as the anterior part of the auricle, are innervated by the sensory branches of auricular temporal nerve. So, you may see. Uh, the tympanic membrane uh, in normal person and you may see the inflammation of tympanic cavity and tympanic membrane 
and also you may see pus inflammation here. So let's we talk about middle ear, second part of hearing agar. The middle ear consists of the tympanic cavity, auditory tube through which it communicates with nasopharynx and mastoid cellar. The tympanic cavity is situated in the base of the pyramid of the temporal bone between the external auditory meatus and labyrinth, internal ear. It contains a chain of three ossicles, three little ossicles, transmitting sound vibrations from the tympanic membrane to the labyrinth. The tympanic cavity is very small and resembles tambourine propped up on its side and greatly inclined toward the external auditory meatus. Six valves are distinguished in tympanic cavity. Lateral, you may see the lateral wall here, or membranaceous wall, paris membranatus in Latin. So, uh, membranaceous wall of the tympanic cavity is formed by the tympanic membrane and the bony plate of the external auditory meatus. The upper, dome like expanded part of the tympanic cavity, the epitympanicus recessus, contains two auditory ossicles. You may see uh, one of them, uh, the head of Maleolus and the anvil. In disease, the pathological changes in the middle ear are most evident in the epitempanic recess. The medial wall, you may see it here, of the tympanic cavity belongs to the labyrinth and, and therefore called the labyrinthine wall, Parius labyrinthicus. It has two openings, around one the fenestral cochlea opening into the cochlea and closed with the secondary tympanic membrane and an oval fenestral vestibule opening into vestibulum labyrinthi. You may see fenestra ovale or vestibule and fenestra uh, cochlea around shape fenestra. Uh, so the base of third auditory ossicles, stapes, is inserted to the fenestra ovale under my pointer. The fenestra cochlea is the most vulnerable spot in the bony wall of the internal ear. Posterior or mastoid wall of the tympanic cavity, paris mastoidus, has an eminence, the pyramid of the tympanum containing the stapedius muscle. Epitympanic recess continues posteriorly with the tympanic antrum, antrum mastoidum, into which the mastoid air cells, you may see antrum mastoidum, so, um, into which the mastoid air cells open. You may see also mastoid air cells. The tympanic antrum is a small cavity protruding toward the mastoid process from whose external surface it is separated by a layer of bone bordering with the posterior wall of the auditory mutus immediately behind the supramutal spine where the antrum is usually cut open in separation of the mastoid process. The, posterior, uh, the anterior or carotid, carotid wall of the tympanic cavity is cut so because it's closely adjoined by the internal carotid artery separated from the cavity of the middle ear only by a thin bony plate. At the upper part of the wall and the tympanic opening of the pharyngotympanic tympanic tube 
or you start in tube, you may see it here, which in newborns and infants gapes. This explains the frequent penetration of infection from the nasopharynx into the cavity of the middle ear and farther into the skull. The root, a roof uh, of a tegmental wall of tympanic cavity, Sparris tegmentalis, corresponds on the anterior surface of the pyramid to the tegment tympani, as you know, uh, and separates the tympanic cavity from the cranial cavity. The floor, or jugular wall, uh, of the tympanic cavity faces the base of the skull in close proximity to the jugular fossa. The three tiny auditory ossicles in the tympanic cavity are called the malleolus, incus and staves, the Latin for hammer, anvil and stirrup, respectively, which they, they resemble in shape. The malleolus has a round head you may see it here, uh, which by means of a neck, column malei, is joined to the handle. The incus has a body and two diverging processes, short and long. The short process projects backward and abuts upon the fossa. The long process runs parallel to the handle of Maleolus medially and posteriorly of it and has a small oval thickening on its hand, the lenticular process, which articulates with the stapes. The stapes justifies its name in shape and consists of a small head, caput stapitis, carrying an articulating surface for the lenticular process of the incus and two limbs, the anterior less carved limb and the posterior more carved limb. The limbs are attached to an oval base, basis stapesius, fitted into the fenestra vestibuli, as I told you. In places where the auditory articles articulate with one another, two true joints of limited mobility are formed. The incudomalarial joint, articulatio incudomalarialis, and the incudostapedial joint, articulatio incudostapedia. The base of stapes is joined with the edge of finestra vestibuli by means of connective tissue to further the tympanus tapedial syndesmosis. The auditory ossicles are attached, moreover, by several separate ligaments on the whole of three ossicles form a more or less mobile chain running across the tympanic cavity from tympanic membrane to the labyrinth. The mobility of the ossicles becomes gradually reduced from malleolus to stapes, as a result of which the organ of carti located in the internal ear is protected from the excessive concussions and harsh sounds. The chain of ossicles performs two functions, as the conduction of sound through the bones and the mechanical transmission of sound vibrations to the fenestral cochlea. The latter uh, from venesta vestibule. So the latter function is accomplished by two small muscles connected with auditory ossicles and located in the tympanic cavity. They regulate the movement of the chain of ossicles. One of them, the tensor tympani muscle, lies in the canal for the tensor tympani, semicanalis musculi tensoris. You may see it here, constituting the upper part of the muscular tubular channel of the temporal bone. Its tendon is fastened to the handle, to the handle uh, of malleolus near the neck. This muscle pulls the handle of malleolus medially, thus tensing the tympanic membrane. At the same time, all the system of ossicles moves medially and the stage presses into the fenestra cochlea. The muscle is innervated from the third division of the gimeral nerve by a small branch of the nerve supplied to the tensor tympani muscle. The other muscle 
the stapedius muscle is lodged in the pyramid of the tympanum and fastened you may see the pyramid histo here uh, and fastened to the posterior limb of the stapes at the head in function this muscle is an antagonist of a preceding one and accomplished a reverse uh, movement of the ossicle and the middle ear in the direction of the fenestral cochlea. The stapedius muscle is innervated from facial nerve. So, in general, the muscles of the middle ear perform a variety of functions, maintain the normal tonus of tympanic membrane and the chain of auditory ossicles protect the internal ear from excessive sound stimuli and accommodate the sound conducting apparatus to sounds of different intensity and pitch. The basic principle of the work of the middle ear on the whole consists in conducting sound from tympanic cavity to fenestral vestibule. The auditory or Ristachian tube, you may see it also here, um, which lends the name histahitis to information of this tube, lets the air pass from the pharynx into the tympanic cavity, thus equalizing the pressure in this cavity with the atmospheric pressure, which is essential for the proper conduction to the labyrinth of the vibrations of the tympanic membrane. The auditory tube consists of ossules and cartilaginous part, uh, which are joined with each other. At the site of their junction, called the isthmus of tube, the canal of tube is nervous. The bony part of the tube, beginning with the tympanic opening, occupies the large inferior portion of the muscular tube channel, of the temporal bone. The cartilaginous part, which as a continuation of the bony part, is formed of elastic cartilage. The tube widens downward and terminates on the lateral wall of mesopharynx. Let's we see a little video about mid-ear and eustachian tube. The middle ear consists of the auricle, which projects from the side of the head, and the external auditory meatus, or ear canal, which passes inwards to the tympanic membrane. We look at the auricle first. The folded outer rim of the auricle is the helix. The helix spirals down into the floor of the central concavity, the concha. The rim of the concha is defined by this curved ridge, the antihelix. Two projections, the tragus and the antitragus, partly hide the entrance to the external auditory meatus. The shape of the upper three quarters of the auricle is determined by the cartilage that forms its framework. We'll divide the auricle along this line to see the cartilage. Here's the cut edge of the auricular cartilage. It's highly elastic. The skin of the auricle is attached to the cartilage closely on the front, less closely on the back. The lowest part of the auricle, the lobule, contains no cartilage. To look at the external auditory meatus, we'll remove the auricle and the surrounding skin. The external auditory meatus is lined with skin. It isn't straight. It curves slightly upwards, then slightly backwards. The external meatus ends medially at the eardrum, or tympanic membrane. This is part of the tympanic membrane. We'll see all of it in a minute. The outer part of the external meatus is supported by a partial tube of cartilage. Here's the cut edge of the cartilage. It's continuous with the cartilage of the auricle. To see it better, we'll remove the surrounding soft tissue. Here's the cartilage of the external auditory meatus. It extends much further below than it does above. To see where we are, we'll take a look at the same area in a dry skull. 
Here's the bony opening of the external auditory meatus. The cartilage of the external meatus is attached to bone here. Here's the beginning of the zygomatic arch. Here, just below it, is the temporomandibular joint. The condyle and neck of the mandible lie just in front of the external auditory meatus. Going back to the dissection, here's the capsule of the temporomandibular joint. With a finger in the external meatus, it's easy to feel the condyle moving. Now we'll remove the mandible so that we can look at the external meatus from in front. Here's where the cartilage of the external meatus attaches to bone. We'll remove the cartilage to see the bony part of the external auditory meatus. This brings us closer to the tympanic membrane. Here it is. To get a complete view of it, we'll remove this part of the bone. This is the tympanic membrane. It separates the external meatus from the middle ear or tympanic cavity. The tympanic membrane is so thin that it's partly transparent. This small upper part of the tympanic membrane, the pars flaccida, is slack. This much larger part below, the pars tensor, is tense. The tense part of the tympanic membrane has the shape of a shallow cone. It's drawn inwards by its attachment to the handle of the malleus, which we can just see here. The apex of the cone, where the tip of the malleus is attached, is called the umbo. The tympanic membrane faces downwards and forwards. This is a true lateral view of it. When seen from the side, it's tilted in this plane. When sound waves strike it, the tense part of the tympanic membrane vibrates. Its vibration is difference, except between these two points, to a ring of fibrocartilage, the annulus. The annulus fits into a groove in the bone. To see beyond the tympanic membrane, we'll remove this part of the bone, leaving the annulus intact. This brings us into the lower part of the tympanic cavity, or middle ear. We'll see a little more of it by dividing the tympanic membrane along this line and removing it. Here's the handle, or manubrium, of the malleus attached to the tympanic membrane. Here below it, we can see how thin the membrane is. Now we'll remove the rest of the tympanic membrane. Here, we're looking into the lower part of the tympanic cavity. There's more of it back here and up here, as we'll see. This is the handle of the malleus. This is our first look at the incus and the stapes. We'll get a much better look at them later. Here in front is the opening for the auditory tube, which connects the tympanic cavity with the nasopharynx. We'll look at the auditory tube, then come back to the tympanic cavity. But first, let's look at a dry bone specimen to see where we've been and where we're going next. After taking the mandible out of the picture, we've been looking up at the underside of the petrous temporal bone from below. To see the tympanic membrane, we removed this part of the bone. Here's the bony external meatus. Here's the groove for the annulus. To see into the tympanic cavity, we remove more bone here. This is the lower part of the tympanic cavity with the three small bones removed. This is as far as we've come till now. The auditory tube, which is where we're going next, begins at this opening at the front of the tympanic cavity. It passes forwards and medially in a narrow tunnel in the bone. The tunnel is quite short. It starts here and ends here. Only the lateral third of the auditory tube goes through bone. Its medial two-thirds pass through a partial tube of cartilage that's represented by this added material. The cartilage of the auditory tube is attached to the base of the skull. Its medial end 
projects beneath the mucosa of the nasopharynx. To see the auditory tube itself, we'll go back to a dissected specimen. In this deep dissection of the infratemporal region, we've removed the zygomatic arch, the ramus of the mandible, and all the muscles of mastication. The external auditory meatus and the tympanic cavity have been exposed, as in the previous dissection. Here's the lateral pterygoid plate. The nasopharynx is here. This is the superior pharyngeal constrictor. Its upper border is here. The auditory tube is up here. It's concealed between these two small muscles. This one is the levator palati, passing down above the free border of the superior constrictor. This one is the tensor palati, passing downward and forward to go round the hamulus. To see the auditory tube, we'll remove the tensor palati and the lateral pterygoid plate. Here's the cartilage of the auditory tube. Here beneath it is the tube itself. To see the auditory tube all the way to the tympanic cavity, we'll open it along this line and remove this part of the bone. This is the bony part of the auditory tube connecting with the tympanic cavity. This is its cartilaginous part. The narrowest part of the tube is here, where it emerges from the bone. The auditory tube enters the nasopharynx here. We saw its emergence into the nasopharynx from the inside in tape 4. Here's the nasopharynx. Here's the back of the nasal cavity. Here's the soft palate. Here's the tympanic cavity. We'll remove the bone that lies above and behind the external auditory meatus. Now, if we look up from below, we can see the full extent of the tympanic cavity. With the auditory ossicles in place, the picture is rather busy. We'll remove them for now, along with the bone here and here to give ourselves a clear look at the medial wall of the tympanic cavity. These two openings in the medial wall both lead to the vestibule of the inner ear. The oval one above, the vestibular window, is occupied by the stapes. This round one below it, the cochlear window, is closed off by an inactive membrane. This bulge, the promontory, is formed by the basal turn of the cochlea. The facial nerve runs here in the facial canal, just beneath the bony surface. In front, as we've seen, the tympanic cavity is continuous with the auditory tube. Up here, behind, it's continuous with a collection of air-filled spaces, the mastoid air cells, which we'll look at in a dry specimen. Here's the tympanic cavity. In this skull, we've made an opening in the upper part of the mastoid process to expose the mastoid air cells. Here are the air cells. The tympanic cavity is through here. The mastoid air cells don't go anywhere. Collectively, they're a dead end body. The stapes consists of a head, which articulates with the incus, an arch that's formed by the posterior crus and anterior crus, and an oval base or footplate, which occupies the vestibular window. Here's the vestibular window. We'll add the stapes to the picture. The edge of the footplate is attached to the inside of the window by a membrane that allows it to enter the stapes from behind. Here's the tendon at stapedius. Its muscle belly is enclosed in bone back here. The stapedius muscle tilts the stapes backwards. The head of the stapes articulates with the incus, which we'll add to the picture. Here's the incus. <coughs> the incus moves the stapes and is in turn moved by the malleus. The incus 
has a body, a short crus, and a long crus. The long crus curves medially, ending at the lenticular process, which articulates with the stapes. The short crus points backwards. The tip of the short crus is tethered to the wall of the tympanic cavity here by the posterior ligament of the incus. On the front of the body of the incus, there's a saddle-shaped joint surface at which the incus articulates with the malleus. Here's the joint surface. We'll add the malleus to the picture, together with the ligaments that hold it in place and the bone those ligaments are attached to. We've already seen that this part of the malleus that hangs downwards, the handle or manubrium, is attached to the tympanic membrane. In the dry bone, this is the manubrium. This is the head of the malleus. This joint surface, facing backwards, articulates with the incus. The malleus is suspended by two ligaments which are attached here behind and here in front. This is the anterior ligament, this is the posterior one. The two ligaments are in line with each other. The malleus makes a rotating movement through just a few degrees around an axis of rotation that's in line with the anterior and posterior ligaments. There's very little movement at the joint between the malleus and the incus. The two bones move together. The movement of the lenticular process causes a tilting movement of the stapes. <coughs> movement of the stapes is restrained by the action of the stapedius muscle. Movement of the malleus is restrained in a similar way by a second small muscle, the tensor tympani. Here's the tendon of the tensor tympani. The tensor tympani muscle is enclosed in a bony tunnel here above and parallel to the auditory tube. Its tendon turns a corner as it emerges from the bony tunnel. The tensor tympani pulls the manubrium and the tympanic membrane medially, the corda tympani. The corda tympani, a branch of the facial nerve, emerges from bone back here, passes between the malleus and the incus, and leaves the tympanic cavity up here on its way to join the lingual nerve. As we saw in a previous section, the corda tympani conveys the sense of taste too much of Okay, we have seen a little movie about external and uh, media uh, ear. So next, let's we talk about internal ear. Uh, the internal ear or labyrinth is located in the depth of the pyramid of the temporal bone between the tympanic cavity and the internal auditory meatus through which the auditory nerve emerges from the labyrinth. A bony and membranous rivulet is distinguished with the latter enclosed in the former. The bony labyrinth, labyrinthus osseus, you may see it here, comprise a number of very small anti-communicating cavities whose walls are a compact bone. Three parts are distinguished in the labyrinth, vestibulum, this is middle part, semicircular canals, posterior part, and cochlea, anterior part. The cochlea lies in front of, uh, medially to somewhat below the vestibule, uh, the semicircular canals are situated behind. So vestibule, uh, which from the middle part of the labyrinth is a small approximately owl-shaped cavity communicating in back through five openings with a semicircular canals. In front of it communicates through a wider opening with canal of cochlea. On the lateral vestibular wall facing the tympanic cavities opening mentioned above, the fenestra vestibule, which is occupied by the base of the stapes. Uh, we saw this um, last picture and on moving. 
Another opening, fenestral cochlea, closed by the secondary tympanic membrane, is located at the behind beginning sorry, of the cochlea. The vestibular crest, crista vestibuli, um, passing into the inner surface of the middle vestibular wall, divides this cavity onto, uh, onto uh, recesses. So, uh, elliptical recessus, elliptical recessus is posterior, and spherical recess anteriorly. The aqueduct of the vestibule begins in the elliptical recess, has a small opening aperture interna aqueductus vestibuli, um, passes through the bony substance of the pyramid and terminates on its posterior surface. Under the posterior end of the crest, on the floor of the vestibule is a small depression called the cochlear recess. Cochlear recess um, recessus cochlearis. The semicircular canals are three arch like bony passage situated in three mutually perpendicular planes. The interior semicircular canal is directed vertically this is anterior um, vertically at right angles to the axis of the pyramid of temporal bone the posterior semicircular canal which is also vertical is situated nearly parallel to the posterior surface of the pyramid while the lateral canal Canalis semicircularis lateralis lies horizontally, protruding toward the tympanic cavity. Each canal has two limbs which open into the vestibule with five apertures, only however, because the neighboring ends of the anterior and posterior canals join to form common limb. You may see this part here, termed the cruz communis. Of the on the one of the limbs of each canal before joining the vestibule forms dilatation called ampulla. An ampulated limb is called cruz ampullare and non ampulated limb is termed cruz simplex. The cochlea is a spiral bony canal, you may see it here, canalis spiralis cochlea, which beginning from the vestibule winds up like the shell of a snail in two uh, and half cows. The bony pillar around which the cow's wind uh, lies horizontally and is called mudiolus. mudiolus. And also spiral lamina, lamina spiralis ossea, projects from the mudiolus into the cavity or canal along the entire length of its curls. This lamina, together with a cochlear duct, divides the cavity of the cochlea in two sections, scala vestibuli, which communicates with the vestibule, and the scala tympani, which opens to the skeletized bone into the tympanic cavity uh, through the fidestra cochlea. So, you can see a part of scala vestibuli number one and scala tympani in number two. And also you may see in this section uh, part of Mediolus. Near the finestra, the scala tympani is very small inner orifice of the aqueduct of cochlea, aqueductus cochlea, whose external opening lies on the inferior surface of the pyramid of temporal bone. The membranaceous labyrinth uh, lies inside the bony labyrinth and repeats its configuration more or less exactly. It contains the peripheral part of the static kinetic and auditory analyzers. Its walls are formed uh, of a thin semi-transparent connective tissue membrane. The membranous labyrinth is filled with a transparent fluid called the indole. 
since the membranaceous labyrinth is somewhat smaller than one in labyrinth. A space is left between the walls of the two, this is perilymphatic space, filled with perlin. You may see perilymphatic space in number one and two. Two parts of the membranaceous labyrinth are located in the vestibule of the bony labyrinth. Utricle, you may see utriculus in Latin, and sacul, saculus in Latin. The utricle has the shape of a closed tube and occupies the elliptic recess of the vestibule and communicates posteriorly with three membranous semicircular ducts. You may see these ducts here, which lie in the same kind of bony canals, exactly, exactly repeating their shape. This is why it's necessary to distinguish the anterior, posterior and lateral membranous ducts with their corresponding apples, ampulla membranosus, anterior, posterior and lateralis. You may see these apples here too. The saccule, a pear shaped sac, lies in the spherical recess of the vestibule and is joined with the utricle and with a long, narrow, delphetic duct which passes through the aqueduct, aqueduct of the vestibule and ends in a small blind dilatation termed endolymphatic sac. Saccus endolymphaticus in Latin. Under the dura mater on the posterior surface of the pyramid in temporal bone. The small canal joining the endolymphatic duct with the utricle and sacco is called the utricular saccular duct. Uductus utricula saccularis. You may see it here. With its narrowed lower end, which it continues with the narrow ductus reunions. Ductus reunions. The sacral joints with the vestibular end of the duct of cochlea. Both vestibular sacros are surrounded by the perlymphatic space. In the region of the semicircular canals, the membranous labyrinth is suspends on the compact wall of the bony labyrinth by a complex system of threads and membranes. This prevents its displacement during forceful movements. Neither perlymphatic nor endolymphatic spaces are sealed off completely from the environment. The perlymphatic space communicates with the middle ear via finestra vestibuli and the finestra cochlea, which are both elastic and yielding. The endolymphatic space is connected by means of the endolymphatic duct um, with the endolymphatic sac lying in cranial cavity, its more elastic reservoir, which communicates with an inner space of the semicircular canals and the rest of the labyrinth. This creates physical prerequisites for the for response of the semicircular canal to progressive movement. So, what the structure of auditory analyzer? Anterior part of membranous labyrinth, the duct of cochlea, ductus cochlearis, enclosed in the bony cochlea, is the most vital component of the organ of hearing. The duct of cochlea begins with the blind end in the cochlear recess of the vestibule somewhat posteriorly of the ductus reunions uh, that connects the duct with sacral. You may see in blue color here. Uh, then it passes along the entire spiral canal of the bony cochlea and ends blindly um, on its apex. On cross section, the duct of cochlea is triangular shape. Uh, one of its Three walls is fused with external wall. External wall uh, of the bony canal of the cochlea. Another wall termed the spiral membrane, membrana spiralis, 
is a continuation of the osseous spiral lamina which stretch between the free edge of letter and the outer wall. The third is very thin wall in number four uh, of the duct of cochlea paris vestibularis stretch obliquely from the spiral lamina to outer wall. The basilar membrane number 12 enclose the basilar lamina which carries the apparatus appreciating sounds, the organ of Carti, or spiral organ. The duct of the cochlea separates the scala vestibuli from the scala tympani, except for a place in thumb uh, of the cochlea where they communicate through an opening called helicotrema. Two of these spaces are connected with helicotrema, number one and number two. Scala vestibuli uh, communicates with the perilymphatic space of the vestibule and scala tympani and blindly at the finestra cochlea. You may see finestra cochlea in a round window. Also, you can see a uh, cochlear duct here, pallius vestibularis, basilar membrane, and spiral uh, lamina. So, also, you can see corti organ or spiral organ. The organ of corti or spiral organ is located along the length of the duct of cochlea. Of the basilar lamina occupying the part nearest to the osseal spiral lamina. Also, you can see the spiral lamina here. The basilar lamina consists of a large number, uh, 24 thousands of fibrous fibers of different length, thickened like strings, acoustic strings. According to well known theory of Helmholtz, they are resonators. The vibration of weak make it possible to appreciate tones of different pitch. According to the findings of electron microscopy, however, these fibers form an elastic network which, as a whole, resonates with strictly great vibrations. The organ of Corti itself is composed of several rows of epithelium cells, you may see these cells here, among which the neurosensory acoustic hair cells can be distinguished. Certain authors claim that this organ performs the role of a reserve microphone converting mechanical acoustic vibrations into electric oscillation. And also you may see the dendrites of uh, sensitive cells and also you can see the bodies of these spare cells, which form spiral ganglion. You can see hair cells here. Uh, and next, let's we talk about organ of equilibrium and balance. The analyzer of orientation or static kinetic analyzer begins in the membranaceous labyrinth where its peripheral part is located. The parts of membranaceous labyrinth are related to the static kinetic analyzer or the analyzer of gravitation. The structure of the static kinetic analyzer, uh, sensory hair cells, you can see these cells here which the fibers of the vestibular part of auditory nerve approach from the exterior are located um, in a layer of squamous epithelium lining in the inner surface of the sacral, atrical, and the ample of the semicircular canals. You can see uh, these crests um, in amples of semicircular uh, canals or ducts. That's right, in ducts. So, uh, in the utrical and sacral, these sites appear as whitish spots, macula and utricula. Uh, macula of utricula and macula of sacula. You can see these cells here. 
cell uh, pair cells. Uh, so the epithelium covering the projection of the cruista has sensory cells with pili which are joined by nerve fibers. You can see uh, the terminates of uh, vestibular nerve fibers. The semicircular canals as well as sacral and utricle may also be uh, stimulated by other acceleration or deceleration of rotary uh, or right angle movements by shaking, swinging or any kind of change in the position of the head as well as by a force of gravity. The stimulus in such instances in tangents uh, of sensory hairs uh, or the pressure exerted of them by the jelly-like substance. You may see this substance here, uh, which stimulates the nerve endings. And also you can see the nerve endings here. Thus, the vestibular apparatus and the entire system of conductors connected with it and reaching the cerebral cortex is the analyzer of the position and movements of the head and space. As a consequence of this, it was named statokinetic analyzer, a receptor of this analyzer in the form of special hair cells, which are stimulated by the flow of endolym is located in the utricle and saccule in macula, which regulates static equilibrium, the balance of the head, and there be the body when is to rest, uh, and the ampulla of the semicircular canals crystal regulated dynamic equilibrium, uh, the balance of the body moving in space. Although changed in the position and movements of the head are also regulated by other analyzers, particularly by visual, motor and skin analyzer. Uh, the vestibular analyzer plays a very special role. So let's we talk about, uh, also you can see hair cells of macula here. Uh, you may see uh, ampulla crests here with hair cells and part of nerve terminates so next let's we talk about analyzers auditory and equilibrium analyzers uh, first we talk about pathways of sound conduction from the functional viewpoint the organ of hearing is divided into sound conducting apparatus and sound appreciating apparatus. The air waves collected by the ear pass into the external auditory meatus uh, hit the tympanic membrane, this one and cause it to vibrate. You may see vibrations here. The vibrations of the tympanic membrane, the degree of tension of which is regulated by contraction of the tensor tympani muscle, you know. Uh, move the handle of the malleolus fused with the membrane. You may see malleolus here. The malleolus moves the incus and the ink is smooth the stapes fitted in the fenestra vestibuli leading into the internal ear. So the displacement of the stapes in fenestra vestibuli is regulated by contraction of the stapedius muscle. Thus the chain of ossicles which are linked in mobility conducts the vibrating movements of the tympanic membrane in a definite direction, namely the finestra vestibuli. The movement of the shapes in finestra vestibuli tears the labyrinth fluid which protrudes the membrane of vestibuli cochlea to the exterior. This fluid 
movements are necessary for function uh, of the highly sensitive elements of Agung Karti. The first to move is the perlymph of vestibule. Its vibrations in the perlymph of scala vestibuli reach the apex of cochlea and the arcaduct via helica trema to the perlymph of scala tympani. Then they descend along to the secondary tympanic membrane here in round window or fenestra. From perilymph, the sound vibrations are conducted to the endolymph, endolymph and throw it to the cargon of corti. So in the receptor which plays a row of microphone, you may see there here, the mechanic vibrations causing fluctuations in the fluid and the lymph are converted into electric oscillation characteristic the nerve process spreading along the conductor to the cerebral cortex. The conductor of the auditory analyzer is made up of auditory conductors lies in the spiral ganglion. The peripheral process of bipolar cells, you may see these bipolar cells here, enters the organ of corti and ends of the receptors uh, cells, while the central process passes as a cochlear division of auditory nerve to its nuclei, nucleus dorsalis and nucleus ventralis. So let's we see in details the auditory analyzer here. So you may see the second neurons in pons. Uh, cochlear nuclei, cochlear nuclei. According to the electrophysiological data, different parts of the auditory nerve conduct sounds of various frequency of vibration. The nuclei mentioned above contain the bodies of the secondary neurons, the axons of which form the central acoustic fasciculus which in the region of the posterior nucleus of the trapezoid body crosses with the fasciculae of the same name on the opposite side, forming the lateral lemniscus. The fibers of the central acoustic fasciculus coming from the ventral nucleus form a trapezoid body and on passing the pans become part of the lateral lemniscus of the opposite side. The fibers of the central fasciculus coming out uh, of the dorsal nucleus run along the floor of the fourth ventricle in the form of auditory stria, penetrate the reticular formation of the pounds and together with the fibers of the trapezoid body become part of the lateral limniscus on opposite side. The lateral limniscus ends partly in the inferior quadriguminal bodies of the tecta lamina and partly in medial geniculate body. So uh, the uh, medial geniculate body contains third neuron, third neuron. So the medial geniculate bodies contains uh, these neurons and the axons of these neurons passes to uh, cortex of temporal lobe in brain. The cortical end of auditory analyzer is located in superior temporal gyrus, uh, here stated fourth neuron in area 41 or Heschler gyrus. Here's, uh, here the vibrations of air in the external ear causing movement of the auditory ossicles in the middle ear and fluctuation of fluid in the internal ear are converted into nerve impulses further in the receptor, transmitted along the conductor to the brain cortex and perceived in the form of auditory sensation. So let's we talk about vestibular analyzer. So first neuron 
of reflex arch in statokinetic analyzer lies in the vestibular ganglion. You may see this ganglion schematically here. Uh, the peripheral processes of the cells of this ganglion advance as a part of vestibular division of the auditory nerve to the labyrinth and communicate with the receptor. Central process pass together with cochlear division of the auditory nerve through the porous acousticus internus in the cranial cavity and farther into the brain matter through the cerebral pontinal angle. Here the fibers of the first neuron divide into ascending and descending fibers and approach the vestibular nuclei. There's second neuron. You may see this vestibular nuclear and pons, which um, are project on uh, rhomboid fossa. So on each side there are four vestibular nuclei, superior, inferior, lateral and medial. The ascending fibers uh, end in the superior nucleus, the descending fibers in the remaining three nuclei. The distending fibers and their accompanying nucleus distend very low through the whole medulla oblongata to the level of gressel and nuclei cuneate. So vestibular nuclei give rise to fibers running in three directions, the cerebellum, spinal cord, and fibers which are part of the medial longitudinal fasciculus. The fibers to the cerebellum pass through its inferior peduncle. This path is called vestibular cerebral tract. Uh, so, um, there are also fibers running in opposite direction, from cerebellum to the vestibular nuclei. As a result, a close connection is established between them, while the nucleus fasciae of the cerebellum becomes an important vestibular center. The nuclei of vestibular nerve are connected with a spinal cord through a vestibular spinal tract. It passes in the anterior funiculi of the spinal cord and approaches the cells of the anterior horns along the entire length of the spinal cord. It is the connection with the spinal cord that are responsible for the conduction of the vestibular reflexes to the muscles of the neck, trunk, limbs, and for the regulation of muscle turners. The fibers from vestibular nuclei comprising part of the medial longitudinal fasciculus establish contact with the nucleus of nerve, nerves of eye muscles. As a result, vestibular reflexes are accomplished by the eye muscles compensating for accommodation of the eyes keeping them directed at certain objects when the head moved. It also explains the peculiar movements of eyeballs, nystagmus, in loss of balance. The vestibular nuclei connected through reticular formation with the nuclei of vagus and glossopharyngeal nerves. This is why dizziness in stimulation of vestibular apparatus is often attended by the brigitte reaction in the form of shaw pulse beat a drop in arterial pressure, nausea, vomiting, cold hands and feet, pale face, cold sweat, etc. Vestibular tracts play a major role in regulating balance and help keep the head in natural position even when the eyes are closed. closed. A decusated tract is directed from vestibular nuclei to the thalamus. You may see third neuron and further the cerebral cortex for considerous awareness of the head's position. It's presumed that the cortical end of static kinetic analyzer is distributed in the cortex of temporal lobes. So adequate training of the vestibular apparatus allows airmen and space flyers to become adapted to sudden movements and change in the position of the body during flights. So, at last, let's we talk about taste analyzer, organ of taste, or gustation. The importance of the sense of taste 
or chemical science consists in recognizing the merits of food. Formations like the taste buds described below uh, already exist in fish, although in this period they were as yet not fully differentiated from the organs of skin cells. Beginning with amphibians, such buds were already concentrated in the arrow and nasal cavities, thus performing the function of taste. In reptiles and mammals, the localization of taste buds is even more limited. They are mainly located on tongue, although are also encountered on the palate, arch and epiglottis in larynx. In man, most of the buds are located in the valate and folate papil. You may see valate papil, folate papil, a much less number in fungiform papil. You also can see fungiform papil. And finally, some of them occur on the soft palate on the posterior surface of the epiglottis in larynx and one on the middle surface of arytenoid cavity. The buds contain the taste cells. You may see them here, which constitute the receptor of the taste analyzer. Its conductor is comprised of the conducting tracts for the receptors and taste consisting of three links. So, first neuron is contained in the ganglia of the efferent nerves of tongue. The nerves conducting the sense taste in men are corda tympani, you may see it here, corda tympani, the first two-thirds of tongue and erase the first two-thirds and glossopharyngeal nerve glossopharyngeal nerve in violet color here uh, the inner rate of posterior one-third of tongue and also soft palate and palate arch and next vagus nerve epiglottis in larynx in yellow color. So, location of first neurons. Ganglion of geniculi. You may see ganglion geniculi here. Here. The peripheral process of the cells of this ganglion run as a part of horde tympani to the anterior two-thirds of the tongue mucosa where they come into contact with the taste receptor. The central process pass as part of the sensory root of facial nerve or nervous intermediates into the medulla, uh, into pons, into pons. The inferior ganglion of ninth pair, a glossopharyngeal nerve, you may see this nerve here in yellow, sorry, in violet color here. Uh, peripheral fibers of the cells of this ganglion run as a part of glossopharyngeal nerve to the mucous membrane of the posterior third of tongue where they come into contact with the receptors. The central processes pass as a part of this nerve into pons, oh sorry, into uh, medulla oblongata. The inferior ganglion of the vagus nerve uh, as a part in yellow color you may see it here as a part of superior lateral nerve the peripheral processes of the cells of this ganglion approach the receptors located in the epiglottis in larynx the central processes as a part of vagus nerve pass to medulla oblongata so, all the described pace fibers end in the medulla oblongata and pons, 
is the nucleus of Tractus Solitari, Nervi Intermedi, Glossopharyngi, and Vagi. This is common nucleus, nucleus Tractus Solitari, which is situated also in pons and passes to medulla oblongata. So, on this nucleus, the second neuron is situated. You may see nucleus tractus solitari here. Uh, so, the processes of second neurons extend from medulla oblongata points to the thalamus. You can see this pathway here in red color. Uh, so, in thalamus, the third neuron is situated and the fibers from these thalamus neurons passes to cortex uh, to parahippocampal gyrus, uh, ancus and kernel of ammons or uh, sea horse or hippocampus. So uh, these cortical centers of taste analyzer are situated near of olfactory centers. This is very important to different diseases between olfactory and gustation systems. So the lecture is over. Thank you very much for your attention. Goodbye. See you again.